Aloha! You are listening to Inside the Desert Oasis Room, episode number 225. This podcast is brought to you by Don the Beachcomber. Enjoy classic dining and cocktails in a tropical, exotic setting. Brought to you by 23 Restaurants Group. Coming soon to Madera Beach, Florida. The legend returns. This podcast is sponsored by Frogtown Brewery, an independent craft brewery and tap room located in Northeast Los Angeles along the LA River. Stop in and enjoy one of their excellent beers from their ever-changing diverse menu. Tell them that Inside the Desert Oasis Room sent you and get your first pint on us. Limitations apply. For more information, go to frogtownbrewery.com and follow them on social media at Frogtown Brewery. Today we chat with Asali Eccles, Casey Beck, Chris Wooten, and Alex Nisnevich, the team behind the upcoming documentary film, Talking Tiki. Learn about what's in store with this exciting film, what they've learned about the tiki subculture on this journey, how it's changed who they are, and here's some behind-the-scenes information about when this film gets released. As always, I hope you enjoy this episode as much as we did bringing it to you. If you'd like to follow our adventures, check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash polynesianpop, where we chronicle events, bars, travel spots, cocktail tutorials, and more. And if you enjoy this podcast, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash polynesianpop where membership grants you early access to podcasts and videos, front-of-the-line privileges to new merch releases, as well as exclusive content, meetups, and screen credits. All righty, let's get into this. Grab yourself a cocktail and join us inside the Desert Oasis Room. And give it up for the team behind Talking Tiki. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Awesome. How are you guys doing? We're good. Good. Great. How are you? I'm doing good, thank you. Well, thanks for joining us inside the Desert Oasis Room. I'm excited to have all of you on the call today. Uh, who am I speaking with, by the way? I recognize Asali's voice. I think I heard Chris and Casey. Um, Correct. Alex, uh, it's here as well. Oh. Alex. Um, I'm a producer on Talking Tiki. Okay. Okay, great. Well, welcome. Welcome. Uh, I'm not Thank really you. even sure where to start here. There's so much that I want to talk with you guys. And perhaps maybe we could just uh, go around the room and have people tell us, like just do a quick intro and tell us a little bit about your background. Sounds good. Sure, why not? Um, hi, everybody. I'm Asali Eccles, and I've been a documentary filmmaker for both, most of my career, really. Um, and, you know, I lived in L.A. for a bit, then moved back to the Bay Area, worked on a ton of projects about all sorts of different topics. But I really love films that are sort of about people who are passionate about things, because I just think, you know... There's so much drudgery in the world. Why not focus on people who are doing something they really care about and finding creative ways to live in the world? And funnily enough, Kiki uh, is one of those ways, I think. So very excited to be working on this film. And yeah, I'll bounce it to you, Casey. Sure. So uh, I'm Casey and uh, with us, Ollie, I'm a co-director on the film and uh, I've been working also in, in documentary pretty extensively for, oh, like about 15 years. Um, although interestingly, this, this film is a bit of a turn for me. My work recently has focused on environmental justice, um, and environmental in injustice and the people fighting to kind of 
fighting against, you know, effects of climate change and environmental disasters. Um, so I think I saw firsthand just how dark and, and horrible the world can be. And so when uh, Asali approached me about this film, um, I was really excited for the opportunity to do something that was really fun and light and... Um, the goal of the film is to bring joy and to kind of explore this really interesting, you know, subculture, subgenre, if you will. Uh, it was a little different for, for me for what I was working on, but was still really excited to do it. And um, maybe I'll just mention it. Actually, Asali, Chris and I met in film school. So we got our MFAs now four years ago um, and have had the opportunity to work on each other's films kind of throughout the years and then this was the first film, first feature that we actually decided to all work on together. Oh, so maybe great. with that, I'll go to, to Chris. Well, I was going to tell that story. I guess I don't need to tell <laughs> that now. But, um, no, that's great. No, we, we did work uh, on each other's films uh, throughout uh, the course of the MFA program, which is fantastic. And as it turns out, uh, I owed these folks a favor. So they called me and I had to come work on this cheeky film. It was horrible. Um, no, of course, uh, I really enjoyed, um, working with them on the films that, uh, that we've worked on over the years. And, uh, it was a good opportunity to kind of cross over into a different area for me. Um, because I mean, aside from a documentary that I worked on with them during, uh, during our MFA program, uh, documentary wasn't really my world. I come from fine arts, design, animation, that's where I came from, and then I decided to go to to uh, to get an MFA in, uh, in filmmaking. So that's what my background is. That's how I came to it, and of course, as you've heard, that's how we crossed paths with each other in the program, and uh, how we ended up where we are. And I've been going to tiki bars honestly since uh, I, I looked at a calendar earlier um, since uh, 1990. Wow. So I've been around for a little while wow, in the few yeah. that were uh, dwindling around at the time that I uh, came of age. You've probably seen some stuff come and go then, I would assume, right, Chris? Oh, for sure. At the time that we were going to them, they were just, um, I mean, it's kind of sacrilege for me to say this now, especially learning what I've learned working on this project. Sure. But, um, they were more or less dive bars at the time that I was going to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and now they're they're just amazing. Yeah, yeah. And we've lost some good ones in the past decade, even. So to go back to '90, there's probably some great ones that you got to experience that um, you know some people will just never have an idea of the grandeur of what they were like. Fair enough. That's true. Yeah, That's very yeah. true. I think. Um, yeah. Even seeing some of the ones today that have changed uh, locally, uh, they're they're certainly a, a far cry from what they used to be. Oh yeah. Whether yeah, that be absolutely. experiential or through the drinks that they serve, um, or just the environment, the way that it used to be, was a very different animal than it is today. So um, it's been an interesting and very enjoyable process to kind of walk back through my own history and see the way things have changed. That's great. And with that. Alex. Hi, uh, I'm Alex. I, of the team, I'm the one who has zero film background, um, but maybe the most tiki background. Um, I've been passionate about, uh, you know, tiki bars, tiki drinks for a long time. Uh, as a, like an amateur bartender, I've been mixing uh, tropical cocktails for a long time. And I kind of roped Asali into this tiki journey initially that has been uh, picked up steam and become the Talking Tiki Project. Awesome. I love that. Well, welcome, guys. Welcome to the podcast. So as I mentioned, when we first got on this call, it was something that I, I, I've wanted to talk with you guys for a long time because there's just so much that I want to ask you, which I'm sure a lot of the questions that I have are a lot of the questions that the community has. So we're going to try and and allay some fears maybe <laughs> for some of the people that are out there wondering, like, who are you guys and what are you doing and are you doing this documentary the right way and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I want to start by asking... 
and Chris is, has already answered some of this, and and I assume that Alex is a little bit also somebody that has a little bit of knowledge and background mm-hmm. from the the Tiki subculture. How long were all of you guys part of the Tiki subculture prior to doing this documentary? And what was the catalyst for deciding to create this film? Well, I think, like Alex said, and full disclosure, Alex is actually my husband. Um, so we, uh, we've been, well, Alex has been deeply into Tiki cocktails for many, many years. And we, we used to host little pop-up party, Tiki parties at our old house. Oh, how fun. And he and his friend, he and his friend James, who is another very, well, amateur might not even be the right word for it. I would say home, very, very uh, skilled and passionate home bartender. Well, and we've done event bartending for money, so I guess I can't call myself an amateur. <laughs> well, then you're a pro, it. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll say semi-pro. Yeah, that's good. It's like the tennis thing. <laughs> yeah. um, anyways, he and James, when they started getting into Tiki, they really went down the rabbit hole. Mm. I actually have... I should dig, dig this footage up. Once we were, they were prepping a tiki party, and I was just filming on a camcorder because I it was hilarious. I was, they were like pulling out all these old recipes. They were we had our spreadsheets. We like had our like we had like all these like we we're doing all this research on how to get these like obscure rums. Like we were really you know trying to get these drinks right. That's awesome. And I feel like for me and Asali, definitely the drinks were the catalyst. And from the drinks, we got more into, you know, the aesthetic, the music. Right. Um, we started building our own home tiki bar in 2020 uh, during the pandemic, as everybody did. <laughs> and that kind of became a whole, like, rabbit hole where we learned about all these other aspects of um, the tiki style and genre. And then yeah. it, it starts to wrap its arms around you, right? Because the thing about tiki <laughs> is there's there's so many gateways into the community or into the subculture, right? Whether it's through the cocktails or through the music or through the art or the architecture or the, the uh, preservationist side um, and even like the lifestyle, right? So just, just the escapism Absolutely. of it all. And then, you know, depending on which gateway you pass through, once you get in there, it's it's like a shot of heroin, right? <laughs> you, you 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 taste the drink, or you you see a performer, or you walk into someone's home tiki bar, and and you get hooked. You know, I mean, it's it's there's so much to it that's appealing. Absolutely, yes, and I mean, I think what's cool for you know every you know for me is finding these other avenues like. I mean, I'm a very visual person, mm-hmm. so from the drinks, it quickly jumps to the style. And I mean, oh my gosh, like you can just go down that rabbit hole for the rest of your life. Oh yeah. And, well, I'm a well on my way, but nothing, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, not so. not at all, not at all. I know you guys have been interviewing a lot of people already: artists, bartenders, enthusiasts, musicians. Have you interviewed musicians already? Not yet. Not yet. But okay. that is on our list. Okay. We yeah, we're hoping to do that this year. Okay, okay. So what I'm getting at is that there's so much to the subculture. Is there any specific piece that you are going to be focusing on or are you just trying to encompass everything? Cuz there's a lot if it, if you're going to cover everything. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean I'll just say a quick thing and then I'll let Casey or Chris speak to this. But I mean, one thing we've been talking about lately is, I mean, there's just way too much for one documentary. Yeah. 100%. I mean, of course there's already been Tiki documentaries, which are fantastic that cover other aspects mm-hmm. of this. But I mean, we were like, this should be a series. I mean, this could be a 12 part series with one hour focusing on each aspect of the subculture. You know, um, we aren't, probably in the position to do that right now um so what our film really as we've done our interviews and sort of explored the subject we're really interested in sort of the current tiki moment so post, it. you know revival what is happening now and and the real central question at least for me is 
why is ha- Tiki having such a moment again? You know, it almost went away entirely. And now it's come back with a vengeance. Well, maybe not a vengeance, but a bang, I would say. So I think, and like, what about, what about Tiki is so appealing to us as Americans now? And what itch is it scratching that's bringing so many new bars out and bringing so many more people into this world? Right, right. When you say Tiki has come back with a vengeance... I don't disagree with you at all. I I sometimes wonder if we have more tiki bars today than we did back then. Uh, I mean, obviously, we don't have a time machine to go and verify that, right? But then I look at, like, the Bay Area in itself. There's so many tiki bars there. Did it ever be like that? Was it ever like that in the past? You know what I mean? Um, like these tiki mugs, right? Like when I first started collecting tiki mugs, I thought I had like, you know, I had hundreds of tiki mugs and I thought like, oh my God, I can't believe that there were so many tiki mugs back then. But these days there are thousands. And I would argue that today, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is a more accurate statement, that there are more tiki mugs that came out in the revival than there ever were during Tiki's heyday in the mid-century. So coming back with the bang, that, you know. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Chris. Or was that Alex? I was going to say, that's definitely, I would be very surprised if that's not true. And as far as the bars go, I'm not completely sure. But if you count home bars, definitely there's way more now than there ever was right. uh, in the mid-century peak. Right, right. Because you you hear or you read that, oh, everyone had a rumpus room in their house and they all had a little tiki room in their house. But I think that there's probably more today than there was before. And that's just, you know, a an educated guess, you know, guess being the key word, because I, like I said, I don't have a time machine to, to confirm that. But it, it just doesn't seem like people were as conscious about what tiki was back then. Like it was really more of a a background thing where today it's a very intentional thing. Yeah. And we were actually, Chris and Alex and I were, were doing, we're watching some of our footage yesterday and talking about the role that the internet has played. Right. Sort of making this more accessible to more people and inspiring more people, you know, now, if you live somewhere where there isn't a tiki bar, you can still be part of the tiki community and buy mugs online and make your own tiki bar at home with inspiration from other folks on Instagram and all over the Internet. So in some ways, I think the Internet broadened and expanded the community in that way, you know? Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. That's that's uh, a huge influence to its growth. Totally. One of the well, things and- that I was thinking about as we were watching that footage yesterday is like how how are people indoctrinated isn't the right word, but how are people being introduced or or injected into um, tiki to keep it going? You know how do, how does the next generation take it from here? That's what my curiosity goes into that, and certainly into the the aesthetics of it, but certainly into the rest of it as well, the rest of tiki culture. Right. Well, going back to what you guys were talking about, filming and documenting what's happening in the world of Tiki today, you know, that's all going to change in a couple of years because it changes every couple of years. Right. The bars change. The people change. uh, The drinks evolve or devolve. Uh, I mean, like there's the the one constant is change. Right. So, you know, I'm an old Tiki guy that's been in in this this quote unquote subculture. I don't know if it's, that's the right word, but I keep using that. And I've seen the changes. I've seen the, the restaurants change. I've seen the bars change. I've seen the bars get more and more elaborate and I've seen the cocktails get more and more complex. And now like everything is every little piece of it is a very important, right? Where I would, I would argue that in its heyday, not every piece was important. You know, maybe the decor was was okay, but the drinks were great. Or maybe the drinks were okay, but the decor was great. And then maybe the food was mediocre. But then, like, you know, it wasn't everything that... Today, if you're opening a tiki bar, 
people are going to judge you on every little piece. They're going to judge you on the the decor and the atmosphere and the food and the drinks and the service and the music. I mean, every little component now is very much a part of uh, the, this this whole thing that you're bringing to the customer. Very true. Very true. I think that's part of well, what we're think- wrestling with and trying to fit all of this into an, into a single film. I think it really needs to be a series. But yeah. I mean, I think also Casey? it's also it's also visual. So you know, I think that's a, that's like a blessing and a curse, right? Sure. And for us, it's it's a it's a blessing. Like we turn our camera on anywhere, and it's just all these things that you're talking about, Adrian. You know, that's what we're capturing. Um, and I think that's what people want to share and that's what they want to talk about. But, you know, I agree. That's also the curse that it's, it is every little thing, every detail has to be accounted for. And, and to, to the credit of many of the bar owners, um, bartenders we've spoken to, I mean, it, it, they have, they've done the work. Like they have thought yeah, about every yeah. single detail, like down to the blade of grass in the bar. Yeah, um, yeah. which I think is also a, a kind of new phenomenon of just, you know, being so, um, like thoughtful and deep and about every, everything, everything in, in the space. And, and the thing is that these days, because we're so conscious of all of those little details, when a place opens up that didn't do their homework, we notice that too, right? We notice when <laughs> they're missing on a lot of pieces so um yeah yeah to that end i'm curious like you know with this documentary there's so much you guys are trying to cover and i i don't even know if this is a valid question but i'm going to ask it anyway the core intention of what you wanted to capture and i don't know if you even knew that yet but uh has is everything going to plan or are you Are you guys finding like, oh, my God, we wanted to start by covering this, but we need to start covering all of this other stuff as well? Like, what surprised you guys so far? I think what has surprised Um, me, yeah, is is just the, the, I mean, the number of, of these, of these locales that exist, I mean, just across, across the nation, I think what's surprising is that every time we talk to someone um, they, they recommend another bar, right. Or another conference or another pop-up or another, you know, Tiki week. Uh, and so I think that, you know, that has ballooned the project, uh, <laughs> beyond what we probably of course. reckoned for, right. you know, I think it started more as an idea about the original Tiki Renaissance in, in the nineties, um, and the work that you and Sven and, and uh, Beach from Barry did to, you know, and many other people to actually make this genre into something that was recognizable and defined and people knew of in the 90s. And then in starting to talk to people who were part of that, we realized like, OK, that was actually just the beginning. It started there, but where it has gone to from there is into this totally different place. Um, and there are these questions today that people are grappling with that, were, you know, were not kind of on the agenda in the 90s. Sure. And I think that has been an interesting surprise and something that we as filmmakers have also had to think about. And, OK, how are we going to incorporate these discussions and what people are talking about? And and I think, to be honest, like these are questions that are coming from the community. So these are these are things that people are talking to us about um, you know, when we, when we reach out to them. And so that's kind of um, something that we're, we're, we hope the film reflects some of the discussions that are happening within the, the people who are truly dedicating their lives to the genre as bartenders or bar owners or, you know, what have you, um, even just hardcore connoisseurs, right? The, the folks who are going to Tiki Oasis and the other conferences um, are also part of that conversation. Right, right. Do you guys see yourself, I mean, here's the thing about this subculture. I mentioned that it's always changing. Like, at what point do you say, okay, I think we've got enough, 
because like you know let's just say you 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 record all of the pieces that you want to record but then something changes right uh, a restaurant closes or a new one opens and you have to decide like do we want to include that like at what point do you decide okay this is where we're going to stop documenting and then we're going to uh, create something from this have you have you discussed that yet this is, I mean, I think this is the struggle for all documentaries. Really. Right. When, you know, when do you stop? Because life continues. Unlike a, a narrative film where you have a script and you shoot the script and you're done, you know, life is ongoing. And, I mean, it's very tempting to just keep filming forever. Um, and some people do. I, I was just editing a film today that I've been working on for eight years. <laughs> oh, my God. But, um, yeah. Um, but... I think, I mean, that's honestly, I, Adrian, I don't have an answer to that. It's a very, very good question. And I think it's a discussion we'll have to keep having as we, yeah. as we go along. But, you know, we mostly, we do want to try to capture sort of the moment now and sure. then put it out there. And then if things change, maybe someone else will go and make that film about Kiki in the late 2020s, you know, sure. that's maybe not our film. And it really, it does feel like every every shoot we do and every person we interview, even if sometimes that leads us down more rabbit holes, every shoot still gives us a better picture of what the story is going to be. So I do feel like every single time we are making progress in shaping this like amorphous concept of what is this Tiki movie. Okay. So for guys like me uh, doing what I do, I want to document everything and when I started this podcast, I thought I would do it probably maybe six months. I didn't expect to do it even for a year. And I'm on year eight now because there's so many things that I just want to record, right? I want to make sure it's documented. So for guys like me, that would be a humongous challenge It's to when to stop recording. <laughs> so I guess that question was more for myself <laughs> let's put it that way it, i hear you adrian i think for me it's helpful to think of every documentary as a time capsule mm -hmm. that it you know i always it's you end when when we decide you know we end when we think is best like we're always kind of in service to the story so you know if it feels like okay we need a couple more shoots we need to see this out for the next couple months um we're willing to do that and then when it ends and we edit, you know, but editing takes many months yeah, too. Yeah. So, you know, that's why you always see the kind of like update in the credits or before the credits of like, here's what this person's doing now. That's because it took, you know, nine months, 10 months to right. edit the film. Um, and then after that, to me, it's a time capsule of like, okay, that was, you know, what we recorded in those two years and that was then. And um, there's, a, there's a beauty in that too, right? Of just being like, sure. being able to see something as it was. Sure. And I'm curious, as documentary filmmakers, how this subject and, and immersing yourself into this subject is changing you as people. Because let's just say you do a documentary on, and I'm just throwing this out there, Lego. I don't know if there's a documentary on Legos. But <laughs> if you do a documentary on Legos, right, and you might get this as an assignment from maybe a production company that you work for or or maybe just so, something that you experienced or you thought, you know what? You know what would make a great documentary? Let's talk about Legos. And in the beginning, you know nothing about Legos, but towards the end of your project, you know everything about Legos. And because you've made this documentary, you're one of the four foremost experts on the subject. And does that change you into someone that's now collecting Lego, right? All because you started making this film like it is this changing you guys as tiki people the more that you learn about everything that's involved in this community from the art to the music to the artistry of the cocktails and and the escapism of of the home bars and the restaurants is that making you a a more diehard tiki enthusiast or is this just a project that like when this is done you 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 clean the slate and you start on the next one. How, how is it affecting you guys? I think for Alex and I, it's it's 
it's a natural part of our journey down the rabbit hole. And if anything, it's it's not only influencing us, but it's influencing a lot of people around us because we're building this tiki bar in our home. It, basically, we, we own a fourplex with some of our friends that has a converted garage. And that's the space. It's a group space that we're turning into this tiki bar. And every time we come back from shoots, we're inspired to, oh, my gosh, we saw all these in New Orleans, all these people in their tiki bars had these TV windows that played right. like a sort of just a scene. And so then we came home and built one. And then, you know, we we then put a bunch of bamboo all around because we didn't, it didn't have enough bamboo. I thought you could show like a before and after of our home tiki bar, like before we started filming Talking Tiki and after right. we started filming Talking Tiki. It's like unrecognizable. Cause we, going to all these like spaces and all these other home bars, like I realized, oh, we are not up to snuff. Right, so like right. now we have bamboo paneling everywhere that I installed. We have like a, an actual like vintage flash blender that I'm learning to use to make drinks. That's awesome. Like it's, I have realized I need to really up my game, you know. Yeah. Plus, and it influences cool. you, right? You you oh, see. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it influences you. Like you see something it's in someone's bar, and you think like, well, that's kind of cool. I want to do that in mine, or I want to do a variation of that in mine. Oh, absolutely. There's so much like cross pollination. Um, and being able to go to a lot of these spaces as part of the filming has really upped the cross pollination on our end. Absolutely. Not to mention, uh, you know, we we filmed at some tiki marketplaces, and I hate to say it, but I I didn't keep my credit card locked away. <laughs> we may have acquired a lot of uh, very lot cool of new, pipes, new, pieces. new new pieces from some amazing tiki craft people. Um, yeah. And artisans. Tiki Oasis is dangerous. Yeah. I, I can't walk through those I, I, because I, it, the temptation is too great sometimes. You know, I'll, I don't need any of it, but then I want it all. So um, <laughs> for me, it's like out of sight, out of mind. Like if yeah. I walk into the ice cream shop, I'm going to buy ice cream. You know what I mean? So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But the cool thing I don't know about the rest of you all, but okay. I'll, I'll say that it's turned me into, this process has turned me kind of into a Tiki snob. Yeah, <laughs> if I go into a bar that's like pretending to be a tiki bar, that's kind of half-assed. Right. Um, I'll walk out. And this is what I mean when I mentioned earlier that we know the we notice when people haven't done their homework, right? We notice when oh, there's this new tiki bar that came out, but the cocktails aren't up to snuff, and they're playing hip hop music, and uh, we notice that's like oh, I think they just want to capitalize on this tiki thing, right? Right. You know, we know we know better. (laughs) And I always say, too, that the Tika community are the toughest people to satisfy when it comes to opening a new bar. If you want to save yourself a bunch of headaches, open a Thai restaurant and just serve good food and you'll get your five stars on Yelp. You open a Tiki bar, man, you got to make sure every little detail is right because they'll find it. They'll find what's missing. Yeah. Well, I feel like the the big difference to me between (laughs) Tiki today and mid-century Tiki is that the fans are so much more discerning. Sure. Um, because it has really become a subculture now, which it wasn't. In the 50s, it was just like, you know, Tiki was all over the place. There were no Tiki conventions because, like, that was the, you know, the main culture. But now there's a whole group of people who really care about getting the details right. Right, right. 100%. And I know that they're looking forward to seeing your documentary because of how passionate they are. But at the same time, it's the same it's the same kind of standard that all of these spots have to live up to. Right. Them wanting to make sure that you guys are doing everything right. You're covering all the right things and talking to all the right people. Right. Um, that's, that's an interesting point. I mean, yeah, I do think we want to get it right. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, I think there's no right way to do it because it's so big. And sure, I mean, sure. I, that's why I'm so glad that the Don the Beachcomber documentary has already been made because that's, you know, now we don't have to get too deep into that history. That right, film right, exists. Right. You know, and I, I hope a bunch of other TV filmmakers come along and fill in the gaps because we absolutely can't do everything, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Along that line, 
let me ask you this because I'm sure people are going to say to me or even put it in the comments, why didn't you ask about the Kickstarter? So let's talk about the Kickstarter. First of all, I want to congratulate you guys in hitting your goal. So congratulations. That must have been an awesome feeling. And um, uh, uh, the question that I'm going to ask you guys, and I'm going to ask this on behalf of the community because I know they're going to ask me, is how are you guys going to use the money from the Kickstarter? Where is the, all the money going to go? Well, I'll say um, right away, actually in 10 days, Chris and I are flying to Salt Lake City. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, great. To film, yeah, to film the the closing day party of Acme Bar Co., yeah. which is Sam Miller's bar, which is becoming a tropical a tropical um, bar in Salt Lake. I don't know if the name is public yet, but very soon it will be. Um, so first things off, like right off the bat is production. I mean, we have been, we were entirely self-funded. And so to be able to, you know, not have to worry about like how expensive the ticket is. Like, you know, if it's like 300, it, when it was us paying, it's like, okay, is it like $300? Okay. I'm willing to do that. But if it's 500, like, Oh no, maybe we can't do it this weekend. But to be like, Oh, we have to be there this weekend. Let's go. Let's buy the ticket. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think that freedom um, is really nice just to be able to do what we need to do in order to make the film happen. Um, and then after that, we're going to be moving very, after we finish production, which, will, you know, so several more shoots this spring and summer, and then we'll be moving into post actually kind of simultaneously because to, to answer your earlier question, another way to answer your earlier question about when is the film done in part, um, you know, we have to see what we have to know what more we need. 100%. So we're actually starting right. To right. Edit as we continue production. Right. So I'll make a, a couple of comments to that. Number one, I want to shout out Sam Miller, because uh, for those who are not familiar with Sam's background, Sam ran the bar for Chef Morimoto at Morimoto's in Waikiki. And uh, for those that are not familiar with Chef Morimoto, you can look him up. He was an iron chef. And so great restaurant, great food. And from there, he went to the Bay Area and he ran Zombie Village for a little bit. So he was at Zombie Village before he ended up going over to Salt Lake City and doing his own thing. So shout out to Sam and and Sam and I are fraternity brothers as well. So um, so he's one of my guys. And then the second thing that I wanted to add to that is for all of our listeners out there who have seen what happened with the Don documentary, which is not unusual. There's every intention of ending this film and this process and getting it out to you guys as as quickly as possible when it feels right. But there are things that happen in the background that sometimes hamper that. So I'm putting this disclosure out here for you guys so that if it, if it doesn't get out there as quickly as you say that it will. It's not that you don't have the intention of that. It's just that sometimes there are things that are out of your hands. And maybe you do need to uh, go back and add some more to it because you, you look at the footage and say, you know what, we're missing uh, something on, on this piece. And we really should include that in the film. Or once you get that in the film and you get everything edited, however many revisions you go through, um, you know, which takes time in itself as well. Um, you know, what's the next step, right? Are you guys going to go through the film uh, festival circuit? Are you guys going to have to look for a distributor and so on and so forth? And all that takes time. And, you know, so please be patient out there. Um, If you guys are excited about this film, like I am, uh, I just know that it takes more time than sometimes you think, right? So go out and change oil in your car and see how long that takes. And if you think it's going to take you an hour, double that so <laughs> yeah yeah we were looking at some of the um footage yesterday and um you know one question leads to another and you find you start pulling threads you know this person's conversation works with this one but we're kind of missing something in between right i wish we had asked this question of that person so we might have to go back and talk to somebody in los angeles or go back and talk right. to somebody in san francisco or, or wherever to get that that doesn't mean we have to go in person every time but um sometimes uh, it's so poignant that we do have to capture something you know and and that also to, 
to kind of dovetail into us trying to finish this in, in a, uh, is a succinct amount of time as we can. Uh, we're trying to take a look at what we have so that we can figure out what questions do we need to be asking. Up until this point, we did a lot of kind of wandering and accepting, kind of being open mm-hmm. to what's out there and absorbing everything. Uh, in the tiki world and then that helps inform us as to what we need to do next and that's kind of where we're at now as we start looking at it figuring out how to ask a more pointed question what's more relevant to you guys right. who are living it every day and to the folks who are new to it and and what's going to be interesting also to the to the general populace right right yeah yeah and sometimes you don't know how it all fits together until you Look, go back and look at the footage and then that and then you realize that you need that right um like with the don doc there were some things that they wanted to go back and film with me and so there are segments with me in that film where i'm wearing different shirts and i'm in a different room because that that the that that had to come back to me a few months later to film some more stuff, right? And so we filmed some in the right. Desert Oasis room, and then we filmed some at Tiki Oasis. And you know, it's it's exactly like what you said. You know, like oh, you know what? We should ask more questions about this. We need to go back and and interview them again. So, um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We enjoyed shooting your experience um, on that Wednesday at CCT, by the way. Oh, wonderful. yeah, that was great. You guys are such pros. I swear, like, a, we went in there, wham, bam, and got it all done, right? Knocked it all out. That was great. Yeah, that was a really touching moment, having you at that corner um, of the bar where kind of everything's happening, right? And and then having you ring the bell and see everybody react to it. It's just so perfect for that community. Yeah, you know, it's 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 considered a huge honor to um ring that bell, so I'm mm-hmm. extremely protective of it. <laughs> so so uh yeah, so uh, I don't know if I told you the story there, but with good reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know if I told you the story there, but I'll share the story here for the benefit of the podcast. I was hospitalized last summer with a pulmonary embolism and I was in the hospital for 5 days and when I was in the ER and the nurse said, we're, we're going to admit you and you're going to be here for the rest of the week. I thought, oh, no, who's going to ring the bell? <laughs> and so I texted the Buens and I said, hey, I'm in the ER. They told me I'm going to be here the rest of the week. So could you please assign the bell to Esteban? Because Esteban's one of the bartenders there. And of course, they replied back. You're in the hospital for a week and you're worried about the bell. Why are you worried about the bell? Like, you know, get well, get well, you know? And I said, no, you guys don't understand. Like, you know, like if I don't ring the bell and and I'm there every Wednesday to ring that bell because I'm really protective of it. But if I miss a Wednesday because I'm on vacation with my family or I'm traveling for business or what, for whatever reason, if, if I assign that bell to somebody, someone else will hate text me, you know, or someone else will, you know, hate email me and be like, you know, Hey, how come, how come so-and-so got to ring the bell? How come I didn't get to ring the bell? Okay. You, you get to ring it next time. So then I'll sign it to them. And then someone else will text me, Hey, how come so-and-so got to ring the bell? So now it's like, okay, please assign it to Esteban cause he works there. Right. So no one can get mad at somebody who works there. Right. He works there. And so um, it, it's become a thing, you know, um, but it, that's how much of a big deal it is. And I'm super protective of that. So uh, in, in any case, that's I'm amazing. I'm, with, with great power comes great responsibility. Right? <laughs> I'm glad you guys were able to be there and and experience that and see, you know, how passionate people are about that bar like the, the, the raving fans that they've created it's a special place i mean you can you can it's electric and you can feel it as soon as you walk in so yeah, yeah. and i think what's amazing is it's electric for everyone who goes in you know whether they are it's their first time or their 500th time um it has that feeling and and i think that's something that exists i would say kind of across the tiki genre but it's particularly true at tiki tea yeah yeah it is it is you feel yeah, you it. can't doubt it just 
when the people come in, I mean, certainly when we were there interviewing, of course, we feel the space, right? But then once the people are there and it comes to life, there's so much, so much going on, so much yeah. uh, generally good feelings and, and so much electricity, as Casey said. It's amazing. Right, one hundred percent, and and just to re- reiterate, like how much how pros how much pros you guys are, you know, people have filmed in that bar a few times, and I think I mentioned to you guys when we were there that we're reassembling that whole bar five minutes before opening, and rushing and rushing and rushing, and you guys were done with an hour to spare. And I was like, you know, like, there's plenty of time. Don't put your gear away yet in case you want to record more, you know. So, um, yeah, you, you guys came in and knocked it out and, and um, with, with plenty of time to spare. And, and you guys blended right in there with the, with the, uh, the, the crowd during the toast. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think. It was a good crowd. Yeah, I don't think people even For knew the you guys part, were there. good crowd. So. Yeah. So that was awesome. That was awesome. Well, I appreciate that, Adrian. Yeah. I mean, I'll say, I think for, for me and for all of the team, you know, I think we really understand the privilege of being documentary filmmakers that, you know, these are real people's lives. We have the the pleasure of capturing. Um, and I definitely don't, we, none of us really ever take, takes that lightly, which is why I think it's such a joy and a pleasure to work with the other folks on this team. Uh, because, you know, I, to be able to blend in, to be able to kind of capture as real as a scene as it can be. Of course, us being there always will change it. Um, you know, that's important to us that we don't, we don't want to be the show. We don't want to be the stars. We want the people who are doing, doing all the cool stuff out there in the world to be the ones who shine. And we just have the pleasure of filming it. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's a, that's a great perspective. Now, I got to get you guys in my bar. I'd love to see you guys to see the Desert Oasis room, <laughs> and I'd I'd love to well, make you we'll a. Talk, a Adrian, but we're sit. we're coming back down to LA in March, so okay. let's talk about dates. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do that offline, and I'd love to get you uh, in the bar and make you guys some cocktails, and maybe I'll have a few people over, and you know, and we'll we'll make a little thing out of it, you know, and just and just have a good time. But um. Yeah. I'm excited about your project. Congratulations on meeting your Kickstarter. Uh, let's throw out Thank for you. our audience where they can find you guys online. And the Kickstarter they can still donate to, is that correct? So, no, the Kickstarter is actually – Kickstarter is very – basically, once it's done, it's done. And oh, really? We're okay. We're very, very grateful we met our goal. And, I mean, huge, huge thanks to – all those folks who generously contributed, we were honestly floored and amazed by the generosity that uh, we received. Uh, so the Kickstarter is done, but we actually, we are um, fiscally sponsored uh, through a nonprofit. So if you want to make a tax deductible donation, you can do so on our website, talkingtikifilm.com. And most of our updates are going to our Instagram, which is at Talking Tiki Film. Okay, great, great. So we'll put all those links in the description for everybody to just uh, just go down there and click that if you would like to get more information on the film or if you'd like to donate and help the film get funded because we all want to see this film get made. So um, Thank you. Well, yes, we, we appreciate your um, all your, you know, involvement and generosity towards us. I mean, I think Casey sort of alluded to this, but one of the things that's been amazing about this film is every person we interview, they are like, oh my gosh, here's five more people you need right. to talk to, and I'm getting, I'm connecting you right now. I'm going to send some emails. And so, I mean, that it all started with just one interview with Jeff Barry, and then we were just like on this roll this train that didn't stop which was awesome right i love that i love that well uh, i'll do everything i can to help you guys so just send me a note and you know if there's anything that i can do to help with with whatever the request is i'll I'll do the best that i can so so i'm i'm here i'm here to help you guys thank you adrian and we're yeah we're so appreciative of, of the support and um we feel like you know we're we're talking to like 
talk peaky royalty when we talk to you. You know, we're like, oh my gosh, like the fact that Adrian is like willing to help us and have us on the podcast and like this is awesome. Oh, that's so, funny. You guys yeah. are feeding my ego. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very flattering. I, I appreciate the kind words. Thank you so much. Um, well, thanks for being on the podcast. We're going to go ahead and wrap up this episode of Inside the Desert Oasis Room. Follow our friends at Talking Tiki Film and the website TalkingTikiFilm.com if you guys want to make a donation and help them get this film done. If you guys want to follow our adventures, we also have a YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash Polynesian Pop. And if you'd like to listen to our podcast archive, check it out at the website DesertOasisRoom.com. Thanks again for joining us for another episode inside the Desert Oasis Room. We'll see you on the next one. Cheers and... Aloha.